Welcome to Mark's Tech Talk. In this video we're going to be looking at the symbols used to represent electronic components. And we'll be looking at uh, individual uh, basic components, resistors, capacitors, transistors, diodes, that type of thing. We'll also look at the symbols used for some switches and for digital logic gates. We'll start out with a simple one, the resistor. Uh, resistor has a zigzag pattern. Uh, there are three peaks on top, three peaks on the bottom, good symmetry. All these angles are the same. And we'll go into a little more detail on how to draw these uh, when I show you how to use uh, various programs such as AutoCAD in order to produce these symbols. Uh, when you draw the symbol for a resistor, you can draw it horizontally like this, or you can rotate it and draw it vertically as needed in your circuit. Turns out there's actually two different symbols for the resistor. Uh, the ANSI stands for American National Standards Institute. Uh, that's the symbol I'm showing you. That's the one that's very common in the United States. Most manufacturers are using uh, that symbol. And then there is a simple rectangle can be used to represent a resistor. That's under the IEC standards. And that is what is used primarily in Europe. Uh, they're actually international standards, but most manufacturers in the United States still use the ANSI standards uh, that are also uh, sometimes referred to as the IEEE standards, Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Uh, it's the same set of standards. Now, you see there are two different symbols depending upon what set of standards you're using. Uh, we're going to be talking about the ANSI symbols uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, it turns out that there is only minor differences between them. Uh, resistor is one, one component that has two different symbols. Uh, a capacitor has some variation in the symbols. And the digital logic gates have a significant variation. But most of the electronic components uh, actually have the same symbol between the two sets of standards. Uh, but again, I'm going to concentrate on the ANSI standards uh, that are prevalent in the United States. Some of the manufacturers are also uh, actually starting to move toward the IEC standards within the United States. They're kind of a newer set, but the uh, majority of manufacturers are still using ANSI. Okay, so the next symbol is a rheostat. Rheostat is a variable um, resistor, and it actually has two terminals and allows you to vary the value of the resistance. And as is typical with most components, in order to indicate that the value is variable, you simply draw an arrow through the component. And the exact direction of the arrow is not critical. Uh, it's just you draw it through the component to indicate it has a variable uh, value. Uh, this rheostat can also be drawn vertically, just like the resistor could. Uh, we also have the potentiometer, which is another kind of variable resistor. Uh, the potentiometer has three terminals uh, so that you can get the fixed resistance on either end or go from one end to the variable terminal and get a varying resistance. Uh, you can actually make a rheostat out of a potentiometer by just connecting together uh, one end lead with the middle lead and then becomes a real step. Uh, most uh, often I think you'll see a potentiometer because again you can use it as a real step if you wish. And when you draw the potentiometer just like the real step and the resistor you can draw it vertically also. Alright so here's the capacitor. Uh, this is the symbol I like to use for a capacitor. It's a straight line and an arc. And notice the arc is about a quarter of a circle. Uh, if you draw that with a half circle, that's too much arc. You really need about a quarter of a circle when you're representing that. Also notice that the gap here is not filled in. There's actually a gap. Don't, don't have a line going through that. Uh, that would be a mistake. You want a gap there if you're properly drawing the capacitor. Uh, capacitor can also be drawn vertically, just like the resistor can. In, in fact, most components you can draw either horizontally or vertically. Um, if you have a non-polarized capacitor, instead of using an arc one on one side, use two straight lines. 
So on the left-hand side, that would be a non-polarized capacitor, and the right-hand side would be a polarized capacitor. Again, that's the United States standards called ANSI standards. Uh, if you look at the international standards, uh, both the non-polarized and the polarized use two straight lines in the international standards. But instead of being straight lines, they're actually very, very narrow rectangles. And if the capacitor is polarized, one rectangle is filled in and the other one is left hollow. Uh, and uh, that's really the only difference uh, between uh, the IEC standards and the ANSI standards. Uh, the uh, IEC uses uh, that non-polarized for both types of capacitors. Now, that being said, uh, in the United States, the ANSI standards, um, you'll find that most manufacturers really don't differentiate between the polarized and non-polarized. Um, they usually pick one and draw all their capacitors the same way. And if it's polarized, they'll put polarity markings there. So they really, in a sense, don't follow the standard. They usually just pick one or the other kind of capacitor. And I actually prefer the capacitor uh, symbol that has the arc, the one on the right-hand side, because the non-polarized, there were two straight lines, can be confused with relay contacts. So I try to stay away from that one. Uh, but anyway, that's part of the standard. So uh, two different symbols for a capacitor, depending upon whether it's polarized or non-polarized. Okay, so there uh, I showed you you could rotate the capacitor polarized. You could do the same thing with a non-polarized. It's just going to show it. And just like the resistor, if you want to make it variable, you simply draw an arrow through the component. Uh, so we have a variable capacitor, uh, either horizontally or vertically. Uh, here we have a coil. Um, you can also call this an inductor or a choke. They all mean the same thing. Uh, it's a passive device that stores energy in the form of a magnetic field. And you draw that using four half circles. Uh, exactly four, you shouldn't have three, you shouldn't have five, you should have exactly four, and it should be exactly half circles. If you have more than half circle, you're gonna see a little bit of a loop uh, where they meet here, and you should not have that properly. It should be exactly half the circle, comes to a point with no loop there. Uh, and again, coil, inductor, choke mean the same thing, and just like resistors and capacitors, you can also draw this one vertically. Variable inductor, just like we've seen, uh, just draw your arrow through there and you can vary the variable, um, the, the amount of uh, inductance you have, okay? And even with a variable one, you can draw that vertically. Okay, transformer is simply two inductors placed adjacent to one another so that the uh, magnetic field encompasses the other inductor. Uh, so that's all a transformer is and it's drawn just like that. Uh, this happens to be what we call an air core transformer. And if we wrap the coil around an iron core, uh, it's called an iron core transformer. And we indicate that with two parallel lines. Now, it turns out some transformers, uh, they'll use some material other than iron. And then those two parallel lines in the middle will typically be a dotted line or dashes or something like that, depending upon the material. Here we have a semiconductor device called a diode. And uh, notice the uh, left-hand side with the arrow is called the anode. And then the straight line there is called the cathode. If you actually have a physical diode, the cathode is indicated by a stripe. Uh, so a diode is a semiconductor that allows current to flow in one direction only. So again, the stripe side is the cathode. Uh, the arrow side is the anode. Uh, that cathode and anode are the names of the leads, and they're not part of the schematic symbol. So when you see the symbol in a schematic, uh, you're not going to see the label on the leads of cathode and anode. And just like the other components, you can rotate this and draw it vertically if you wish. Okay. All right, here is our first transistor. This is an NPN transistor. Uh, it turns out there's a lot of different kinds of transistors. This is uh, junction transistor, really basic transistor. Uh, a number of things to point out here. Uh, first of all, uh, this line here, this vertical line, in this case is not centered, it's off-center. And these diagonal lines do not extend from the end or the middle. They extend about 
halfway between the middle and the end here. So these diagonals kind of break this up into quarters. So about one quarter of the way down, you have the diagonal line. Another quarter down, you have this uh, perpendicular line. Another quarter down, the other diagonal. And then another quarter to the end. Uh, so with the arrow pointing outward, that would be an NPN transistor. And just like the other components, you can rotate this. You can actually flip this around if we prefer. Um, you know, this is a uh, whatever you need to get uh, for your schematic so you don't have crossovers. Rotate or flip that as much as you want. Uh, the names of the leads are uh, as follows. The one with the arrow on it is called the emitter. Uh, the one opposite that without the arrow is called the collector. And the one that comes off perpendicular is called the base. And you should know the names of those leads. Emitter with the arrow, collector is opposite that, and base comes off at a right angle. That is an NPN transistor. Here's a PNP. It's exactly the same as the NPN, excepting the direction of the arrow. Here the arrow points inward for PNP transistor. And just like we saw before, you can rotate this or flip it or whatever you want. And the leads are named exactly the same. Uh, for the PNP as they were for the NPN. Uh, the lead with the arrow on it is the emitter. Opposite that is the collector. And perpendicular lead is the base. You can remember these if you want by the PNP. Uh, some people remember it saying pointing in proudly. Uh, that's one way to remember that. And the NPN is not pointing in. Not pointing in NPN. That's how you can remember which symbols which. Uh, for the PNP and NPN transistors. All right, here's another kind of transistor called an FET. FET stands for field effect transistor. And uh, you can see that it looks a bit different than our junction transistor. And it's actually the names of the leads are different. Here we have a source and a drain and perpendicular with the arrow on it is the gate. And that's the one's really unique uh, does not really have to know that particular one uh, in terms of the three leads. The gate is the really important one for the FET. With the arrow pointing inward on the FET, that would be called an N-channel FET. N-channel FET has the arrow pointed inward. And likewise, if the arrow was pointed outward on the FET, that would be called a P-channel FET. P-channel, arrow points outward. Uh, and again, the names of the leads, same thing source and drain and the lead with the arrow on it is called the gate. All right, here is a relay. The relay actually has two different parts. Uh, the inductor on top is called the coil and then on the bottom are the switch contacts and um, they are actually connected together with a mechanical linkage. Uh, so that dotted line indicates there's a mechanical linkage between the coil and the switch. Now the switch has designation NC, stands for normally closed. It has an NO for normally open, and the C simply indicates common. Uh, so that's how you uh, decipher those designations on the switch portion of the relay. So the relay again has two parts, the coil and the switch, and they're mechanically linked together, and the dotted line indicates that. All right, here we have the symbol for a battery, and I have shown you the polarity markings. Normally, when you draw that in a schematic, you do not include the polarity markings. The positive terminal would be the longer one, and the negative terminal would be the shorter one. This happens to be what is referred to as a single cell battery. Uh, single cell batteries are batteries that are typically in a neighborhood of one and a half volts, uh, like a, uh, a C battery or a D battery or AA or something like that. Those are all called single cell batteries. Multi-cell battery, you just stack a couple together and uh, those would be typically, let's say, uh, the nine volt battery or a 12 volt battery in your car. Those are multi-cell batteries, typically uh, a higher voltage uh, than the single cell. So again, single cell is usually around one and a half volts and the multi-cell can be uh, six volts or nine volts or 12 volts or something like that. Here's more generic uh, DC source symbol. Uh, usually uh, indicate a DC source that is not a battery, such as an electronic power supply. Uh, so that would be a circle 
with the polarity markings on it. So it's a DC source. And an AC source, very similar, a circle, but this time you have the symbol for a sine wave inside. And that's what AC usually is, it varies back and forth uh, in the shape of a sine wave. A generator uses a very similar symbol. It is a circle with a capital G inside of it. That's a generator. And a motor, again, a circle with a uh, uppercase M inside of it. Amp meter, circle with a large A, or perhaps a uh, MA for milliamps. So that's an amp meter. Antenna looks like this. There are a number of different kinds of antennas. This antenna actually has one terminal. And then you could have another antenna like this. This would be what's called a loop antenna. A loop antenna has two terminals. And again, there are many uh, antennas. Those are uh, a couple of the more basic antennas. Here is a fuse, and uh, uh, this didn't show up too well on my drawing because that uh, should be like an S shape, but it's a continuous curve there. It should be a nice smooth curve. Mine looked like a bunch of line segments. Uh, when I transfer it from the, my drawing program into my presentation. Uh, but that should be a nice smooth curve, like an S shape. Fuse, remember, is an overcurrent device. Uh, if you pass too much current through it, the element will melt and open the circuit. Here is a uh, piezoelectric device. It's called a crystal. You don't see these too much very much anymore. Uh, they were used in early radios to set frequency. So if you want to um, have a particular frequency for your oscillator, you may use a crystal. Uh, and that is a piezoelectric device where the dimensions of the crystal determine the frequency of oscillation. And one of the problems with that is you actually have to change the physical dimensions in order to change the frequency. So you have to cut the crystal to different sizes for different frequencies. And then if the temperature changes, uh, the crystal will get larger or smaller because of contraction and expansion, and that would change your frequency. So typically, these things are used in what's called an oven uh, to heat it up a little bit above ambient temperature to try to stabilize that temperature and therefore the frequency. You don't see these quite as often anymore. Uh, most of the uh, frequency is set by digital techniques anymore. Here is an earth ground. There are a number of different ground symbols. This is earth ground. And this is a chassis ground. So we have earth ground, chassis ground, and then this is what's referred to as a common ground, common ground. And this is a jack, like a headphone jack, and a plug, like the uh, plug on the end of headphones, something like that. A shielded plug, these are sometimes referred to as RCA plugs. Uh, and here is a symbol for a speaker. Okay, let's take a look at some switches now. Uh, start out with a push button switch. Uh, you depress the switch in order to make the contacts. This is a normally open push button switch, normally open. Notice that the uh, contacts there are the circle, uh, two circles there. Again, they should be circles, they shouldn't be those line segments. And then the horizontal part is the contact, and that should not touch. Uh, because you can envision that you'd push down on that in order to make the connection. So when you draw it, you draw it so it's not touching. Uh, can contrast that with a normally closed push button switch uh, that would look like this. And notice here uh, you have a connection between the two contacts when you're not pressing on the switch. When you press it, uh, that uh, would move away from the two contacts and you would no longer have continuity between the switch. Uh, this is drawn as two separate switches, normally open and normally closed push button switches. Often when you purchase these, they actually have both kinds of switches in one package and you just uh, wire it up to whatever terminal you want. Uh, usually uh, two of the terminals are wired together, they're called common, and then you have a normally open and a normally closed pin. So that all this is occurring uh, within one case, if you will. Here is a, a, a single pole, single throw switch. This might be a toggle switch um, or a rocker switch or something like that. Uh, notice there are two terminals on the single pole, single throw. Pole is the number of circuits and throw is the number of positions for the switch. So this is the simplest kind of switch, 
single pull, single throw, and that has two terminals. Here is one that's called single pull, double throw, one circuit, two different positions for the switch. So that switch can be flipped in the up position or the down position. Uh, this is called single pull, double throw, and this would have three terminals. Um, electricians use a switch like this to control light from two different locations. So they have two switches like this, uh, one perhaps at the bottom of a set of stairs, another at the top, and they refer to it as a three-way switch. Three-way switch is, uh, again, a name that electricians use. In electronics, we call it single pull, double throw. Here is a double pole single throw. It's just two single pole single throw switches that are mechanically linked together. Okay, so two different circuits, one position. Now, what's not shown here, and sometimes it's shown, sometimes it isn't, is sometimes there's a dotted line between these to show that they're mechanically linked. So when you open one, the other one opens at the same time. So these are mechanically linked together. You may or may not see the dotted line to indicate that mechanical connection. This is a double pole single throw switch and this has four terminals. Here is a double pole double throw and here I am showing you the dotted line to show you the mechanical linkage. So again, two different circuits. Each circuit has two different positions for it. It's called double pole double throw and the double pole double throw actually has six terminals. Okay, so let's move on to digital logic gates. Digital logic gates, and I have a separate video explaining uh, what these logic gates do, but uh, let's take a look at how you sketch these out, how you draw these gates. We'll start out with the AND gate. Uh, the AND gate has two inputs on the left-hand side. It has one output on the right-hand side. The inputs go to a straight line. Uh, the output is a half circle and uh, connected to the half circle is two straight lines here. So you actually have three straight lines and a half circle as part of the AND gate. And uh, you'll need at least two inputs. Some AND gates have more than two inputs. Um, pretty common to see four inputs. Uh, two inputs is certainly the most common, but four is, is out there quite a bit. And you can actually get AND gates with more than four inputs also. Uh, but uh, Again, you have to have at least two inputs. Because those are strictly inputs and the one on a half circle on the right here is an output, you usually uh, draw your gate in this configuration because you want your signal flow to go from left to right, input on the left, output on the right. So you usually do not flip this around. Uh, once in a while, you'll rotate it, uh, but most of the time you're going to see this drawn horizontally just the way you see it here. All right, so the symbol I just showed you is the ANSI symbol that is used in the United States. Uh, the international symbol uh, is just a rectangle with an ampersand uh, in it. Uh, that, I think, is used less frequently. Even in, in Europe, I think most of uh, what I've seen in terms of schematic use the ANSI variation, and that's uh, pretty much what I stick to. Uh, all the gates uh, in the IEC standard are all uh, rectangles like this, and they just use different uh, symbols inside the rectangle to indicate different kinds of gates. Uh, so we're going to stick with the ANSI uh, standards here. Um, okay, so the next one would be an inverter. Uh, inverter is simply reverses the digital signal from a zero, makes it a one, or from a one, makes it a zero. Uh, you have a triangle and a circle. Uh, really, really important to have that circle on the output because that's what does the inversion. The triangle is kind of a generic symbol for an amplifier, and the circle is what does the inversion. So the circle is a really, really important part of this symbol. Then we have a NAND gate, which combines the AND gate with the inverter. It takes a circle from the inverter and puts on the output of the AND gate and makes it a NAND gate. NAND stands for not AND. In other words, an AND gate with an inverter on the output. Here is an OR gate. Notice the OR gate is drawn differently. Uh, we'll start out on the input side. Here you have an arc instead of a straight line uh, for the OR gate. Uh, you still have two straight lines on the top and bottom, 
but on the outward side, instead of having a half circle, you actually have two distinct arcs that comes to a point. So with the OR gate, you have two arcs that come to a point, and then another arc on the input side. Remember the AND had a straight line here and had a half circle. So the OR gate, you have three arcs, uh, and the AND gate, you have one. All right, this is an exclusive OR. Uh, you add a second arc on the input. Uh, that is exclusive OR. And then, of course, you have the NOR gate, which is an OR gate with an inverter on the output. So it's just like an OR gate, but you put a circle on the output. All right, one other thing I want to cover before we wrap up here, and that is how do you show wires crossing one another uh, in a schematic symbol? Uh, fashion. So if you're drawing a schematic diagram and you have to have uh, wires crossing, what do you do? Well, uh, if you have wires crossing without a connection, the best thing to do is to have one of them kind of jump over the other with a half circle. It's really, really clear when you draw it this way that there's no connection. Uh, if you want to make a connection there, indicate that with a dot. Again, very, very clear that these two wires are connected together. Uh, if you have uh, two wires across here and you don't have a dot and you don't have a half circle, it's really not real clear uh, as to what's intended there. Uh, technically speaking, that, that should indicate there's no connection there, but uh, it is a little bit confusing and I would encourage you not to draw uh, in that fashion because it is confusing. So again, my recommendation is don't use a signal crossing like this. It just uh, adds to the confusion. Now, if you have a T connection here, uh, it turns out that means there is a connection there and you don't have to put the dot because the dot simply adds redundancy because, uh, for example, on the left-hand side, there would be no reason to extend this uh, line here unless it was connected here. That's the only reason extended there. So uh, that does show you a connection and you don't have to have the dot. And again, the dot technically is okay, but again, it's kind of redundant. Uh, I think it just kind of makes your diagram a bit busy. I, I recommend you don't use it. Uh, that's my recommendation. It's not wrong, but again, I just think it makes your, your diagram a bit too busy. It's really not necessary. All right, so that wraps up this edition of Mark's Tech Talk. Hope you learned something new, and stay tuned for more. Have a good one.